Hello, welcome back once again. In this chapter, we're going to look at the last method of valuation. We're going to look at some market-based approaches. Market-based approaches are also called relative valuation. Uh, in contrast to the prior valuation methods that we have looked at, those are all fundamental valuation. So what's the difference? In fundamental valuation, um, the value of the firm is based on the fundamental determinants. So those determinants are the growth potential of the firm, risk associated with the firm, um, which is expressed through the required return. Um, and if you're looking at it from a common shareholder perspective, there will be the cost of equity. Um, and remember that risk include, uh, this is the systematic risk, uh, and it, it includes both the business and financial risk associated with the firm. And the, um, the value is based on the future payoffs to common stockholders. And we can, and we have looked at uh, different estimates for what the, uh, to how to estimate this future payoff. These include dividends, free cash flows, um, and also residual income. So all these are part of the fundamental valuation approach. Under this approach, the firm's value is the present value of expected future payoffs. So it will be the present value of expected future dividend. And the discount rate we use is the cost of equity. Or using free cash flow, once again, we'll use the present value of free cash flow for common shareholders discounted at the cost of equity. And then for the residual income approach, we start with the initial book value, and then we also add the present value of future residual incomes. So all these methods, the value of the firm is the present value of future payoffs. So those are fundamental valuation approaches. In this chapter, we're going to look at relative valuation. Relative valuation means we are comparing the value of this firm versus other firms in the market. In real estate valuation, this is sometimes referred to as the comparable. So to estimate the value of your house, instead of figuring out, figuring out the future payoff to you as the homeowner, a real estate agent sometimes will find a comparable property in the neighborhood and use that to come to a uh, relative value of your home. Uh, so oftentimes you'll look for a property that has similar number of bedrooms, bathrooms, location, or square footage, and then use that to come up with a value. So the important thing there is how much is something else, another asset, selling for in the marketplace currently. Relative, in his case, is relative to other prices in the market. So this is why it's also called market-based valuation. For stock valuation, um, we, use, we choose important financial metrics. So I mentioned in a real estate comparable, we may look at the number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, garages, and so forth. Those are key metrics for a house. For firm valuation, we identify key financial metrics. Um, in contrast to the fundamental valuation, the growth potential as well as risk are both embedded in the market multiples. A good advantage of relative valuation is that it is easy to compute, but there's also an important assumption. The assumption is that the market is efficient and is in equilibrium. Therefore, uh, other assets with similar financial metrics are priced correctly in the market. A drawback of relative valuation is that if the entire market is not in equilibrium or is not efficient, um, Relative valuation will not be able to identify bubbles or overvaluation or undervaluation. 
here are some common market multiples. Um, these are more rule of thumb, and this is what is most popular amongst analysts, but these are by no means the an exhaustive list. You will see some uh, pattern as we explain each of these. Um, one multiple that is used a lot is called the market to book ratio. It's basically the market value of common equity. Sometimes this is called the enterprise value divided by the book value of common equity. This is the aggregate value of the firm, and this is the aggregate value of book value. More common when we use market multiples, we use per share value. So another way to define the market to book ratio is to take the stock price, so price per share, divided by the book value per share. Uh, book value per share obviously is just uh, value of common equity divided by the number of shares outstanding. Similarly, price earnings ratio or PE ratio, you have heard that a lot, PE ratio is one of the most popular market multiples. Um, and that's defined as market price, so price per share, divided by earnings per share. Ideally, we use expected earnings, but practically, uh, oftentimes analysts will use the most recent earnings. Um, we'll talk a little bit more um, in depth about the implication of that. Since we know that earnings are not static, meaning that earnings are unlikely going to stay constant forever, uh, an alternative or a supplement uh, ratio is called the price earnings growth ratio, which takes into account the long term growth rate. So, G here is the long term growth rate of earnings. So, it's a sim very, very similar to the price earnings ratio, except uh, we take into account future growth potential. In addition to earnings, which is net income, uh, sometimes other variables from the income statement is used to create these multiples. Uh, one could be price to sales. Um, so this would be revenue, uh, uh, this is price per share on the stock price divided by sales or revenues per share. Same thing, we can create a price to EBITDA ratio. Um, and the reason for that is if a company happened to have negative earnings currently, then the PE ratio makes no sense. You cannot have a negative ratio. So for companies that have negative earnings, sometimes you, uh, analysts may use price to sales or price to EBITDA ratio to estimate um, the value of the firm. The bottom line is that the multiple should make economic sense and is based on a financial metric. So whether it be EBITDA, sales, net income, book value, it should be reliable, meaning that the calculation of it is consistent um, and easily accessible. So, we, so, so far, the ones that we have proposed here, um, book, book value, net income and sales are all US GAAP required reporting financial uh, uh, metrics. So this is easily accessible and reliable. EBITDA is non-GAAP, uh, which means that it is up to a firm whether or not they want to report that. Uh, however, this is a very common ratio to use because it is before um, a lot of um, subjective or tax strategizing um, deduction. So before depreciation and amortization and before interest. So this represents the operating profit of a firm. Professor DeModeran at NYU have um, collected and tabulated um, market multiples by industry. So you're welcome to go and download and 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 see what he's um, what each what the average multiple is for various industry. Here are common multiples uh, by sectors or by industry. Uh, EV stands for enterprise value, so this is the market value to EBITDA ratio. Let's take a look at a couple of industry. Uh, first, let's take a look at pharmaceuticals. So pharmaceutical company has a uh, price uh, to EBITDA ratio of 13.67. Let's compare that to software. 
software has a um, in general and a ratio of over 20 so it's much higher and then let's take a look at um, trucking trucking industry has a multiple of 9.93 so what we see is that there's a huge variation in uh, enterprise or price to EBITDA ratio across different industry we're going to take a look at some of this um, in an exercise ourselves but in general you can see that software company has higher growth potential and compared to the trucking industry um, and pharmaceuticals have high growth potential but also high risk and is somewhere in between software and trucking before we delve into relative valuation model as you can see they are very simple to use very simple to calculate what we would like to do before we get before we, we do that is to take a look at how are the fundamental valuation model and the relative valuation model related to each other so first, let's take a look at the market to book ratio versus the value to book ratio. If the stock markets are efficient and in equilibrium, then the market value should equal to the fundamental value, meaning that the market to book ratio and the value to book ratio will be the same. When we take a look at the value to book ratio, let's, you, let's take a look at the residual income model. Remember that the residual income model, is the, the value of the firm is defined as the initial book value plus all future um, residual income. This counted back as the present value. So remember C, um, V0 is the value. So this is the value that we will use to compute value to book. CI is the comprehensive income, book value, is BV and then RE is the cost of equity. So the difference between these two is the residual income. Now, when we compute the value to book ratio, we take the value divided by the book value. So we take the initial, the value we computed divided by book value in year zero. So BV divided by BV will be one. And then we divide B0 uh, throughout the second term as well. And this term has some very interesting property. So if we define comprehensive income return on equity, remember we have seen this before. So this is ROE. This is ROE using comprehensive income. And that is the current ROE, uh, comprehensive income divided by the most recent book value. And the difference between these two, the difference between the ROE and the cost of equity we can call that the residual roe so remember when we subtract the dollar amount we get the residual income if you subtract the uh, roe and the cost of equity which is a which both are the percentages we got a residual roe this is the general case we can also take a look at the limited horizon case when the forecast horizon is finite, then the value to book ratio has three components. This is very similar to the residual income valuation model. The first item is the value, book value divided by initial book value. So initial book value divided by initial book value, of course, gives you one. So that's the first component. The second component is the present value of the residual ROE during the forecast horizon so this is a finite horizon and then the last component notice that this is um, the perpetual growth model so this is the continuing value component so this is the continuing this is the present value of the continuing value of the residual roe here are the notations so v is the value of common equity this is comprehensive income and this is the comprehensive income um, ROE. BV stands for book value and ROE is the cost of equity. So there's something that we do want to keep in mind. When we divide the current book value by last year's book value, this is the growth, annual growth rate of book value. 
And then when we divide book value by the initial book value at any point in time, this is the cumulative growth rate. This is a cumulative growth of book value up to time t. In an earlier chapter, we, we talk about sustainable growth rate. Sustainable growth rate is defined as the growth rate that a firm can achieve with no new external equity and a constant debt to equity ratio. The sustainable growth rate can be approximated by ROE times one minus the dividend payout ratio. So basically, um, this is the growth rate that is represented by reinvesting our retain, uh, retain earnings. We'll end this video here. In the next video, we're going to go over an example. See you soon.